座，然后这次的讲座呢会是用英文进行的、哦。这次的讲座是会用英文进行，请各位注意一下、哦。好，大家有没有想过，无数的谜题要怎么样不用文字，然后来去做，来去跟大家做交流，然后怎么样用数千张的图片，要怎么跟拆解组合之后又还还可以再跟玩家一起去做互动？今天我们邀请到了 Gorogua 的设计师来跟我们。交流一下，说要怎么样，用怎样的元素、怎样的灵感，才可以造就出现在获获奖无数的一个作品。让我们欢迎 Gorogoa 的设计师 Jason Robert。Is this thing on? Am I getting sound? Yeah. Really? It's amplified. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, welcome to my talk. Um, maybe it's just a small room, but this seems like a pretty big crowd, so I'm I'm honored. Uh, my talk is about my game Gorogoa. I hope you've you've played it. Uh, if not, I hope the talk makes it more interesting when you do play it. I my name is Jason Roberts. Um, this is the only game I've ever made. I was a software engineer until about 2012. I was working on. I was working on Gorogoa. That sounds better.、Uh, so I was working on the game before then, but I quit my job to work full time on the game in 2012. I had no game development experience.、Uh, I hadn't really read anything about game development, and I don't encourage anybody to take that approach or to follow in my footsteps because I think that's part of the reason why it took five years to make because I had to learn as I went along. And it also means that having made only one game, I can only talk about my experiences making that game. You know, I can't impart. I don't feel qualified to impart a lot of really high-level、uh, wisdom about game design. So I'm just going to tell you、uh, my experience.、Uh, I've I'm quite often asked, of course, how the game came to be,、uh, what what gave me the idea for the game. And I've given a lot of answers, and I've tried to be coherent. But for the first part of this talk, I'm going to try and answer that question more fully than I have in the past,、uh, starting all the way back in my childhood. But bear in mind that this story of how the game came to be is partly a reconstruction because I don't really remember everything that happened.、Uh, I want to start before the beginning、um, and go over some of the things that inspired the game.、Uh, Again, starting all the way back when I was a kid,、um, I'm going to list a lot of different people and works that inspired me. And this is not a complete list; these are just the ones that are like the biggest,、uh, most conscious influences on the design and on me as as a designer. So when I was a little kid,、uh, we had a lot of big books in the house by this、uh, 19th century painter named David Roberts.、Um, no relation to me. Uh, who traveled the Holy Land and Egypt and painted a lot of these old, crumbling temples、uh, and castles that are half buried in sand? And these are sort of powerfully、uh, romantic images.、Um, and I think David Roberts' audience were Europeans who probably didn't know much about、um, Egypt. And so their their attitudes may have been tinged by a certain amount of、um, colonialist condescension, but these these weird, unexplained temples、uh, just allowed people to project this kind of fantasy about a forgotten world full of forgotten secrets, and that certainly worked on me as a kid. And I loved these paintings, and they had a huge influence both on my style as an artist and also on. My, on the subject matter, on the things I like to draw.、Uh, next up, chronologically, I believe in in grade school, I saw this book by Chris Van Alsburg called "The Mysteries of Harris Burdick."、Uh, the book is made up of a collection of images. You see two of them here. Each image is supposedly from a different story, but the original stories that go with the pictures have been lost, according to the book. And the reader is challenged with filling in, with writing the stories to go with each picture. 
And I think this book uh, taught me a lot at an early stage about the narrative power of a single image, um, especially an, an image in isolation that can suggest something is going on, suggest that there's a whole world that extends beyond the boundaries of the frame that you, you can't see. And it so happens that I just picked two of these uh, images and put them side by side. They aren't related. I mean, none of the pictures in the book are supposed to be related. But just because they're presented here together, your mind automatically tries to connect them narratively. And I mean, I think that's helps indicate what I think is really interesting about what I call multi-panel game design. Another very important game for me was a 1987 game called The Fool's Errand. Uh, black and white graphics that had this sort of very mysterious shadowy silhouette art style. Um, it's based on the tarot, so just like the just like tarot cards themselves, um, they're kind of full of this evocative, half-shrouded symbolism. Uh, it, the game is made up of a whole bunch of little puzzles, little picture puzzles and word puzzles, and they all come together in the end in this big, super elaborate meta puzzle, um, which you see on the right, where you have to arrange all these tiles on a grid to form a larger connected image. Uh, and you'll see on the left-hand side is a card game that's uh, part of the Fool's Errand that's based on the tarot deck and has mysterious rules that you kind of have to figure out as you play. And another huge influence is this book uh, called Maze by Christopher Manson. And the whole book, it's got 45 pages. Each page is supposed to be a room in this mysterious maze. It's all illustrated with these great woodcuts uh, and accompanied by the really this wonderfully ambiguous text. And you get the feeling that the ma this maze, this building, is a place that kind of exists outside of space and time. Um, its meaning and its purpose is is unknown, but feels kind of ominous. Uh, and I I love this. I, there's a there's two puzzles in the book. You're supposed to find a path through the maze and then s and then discover a riddle and then discover the answer to that riddle. I never solved the final puzzle, and now I don't want to because the I cherish the mystery that this uh, that this book has for me. Um, and this is probably less surprising. Um, Cyan Worlds games from Cosmic Osmo, Mist, Riven. Again, what made these games work for me it has to do with uh, tone, sort of this uh, tone of elusive mystery. And I especially like that these games aren't set in any place or time that you can, you can track. They're not exactly ancient. They're not exactly modern. In the case of Mist and Riven, these are imaginary worlds from the imagination of imaginary characters. And that suggests the possibility that they're worlds that are kind of like mental worlds uh, full of unconscious symbols. And that, you know, that, that potential symbolism is the kind of thing that really, really fascinates me. Uh, Gustave Doré um, is another 19th century traveler and illustrator and is, is sort of a midpoint between uh, David Roberts and Christopher Manson, who made uh, Maze. And then he has that, um, these are all engravings. Th these are, I like especially because this is, these are of the Alhambra in Spain. And, you know, I love this, the intricacy of um, the Islamic decoration, and which literally blurs the lines between text and decoration. So that, that sort of feeds my fantasy that, all architecture is full of hidden messages for the observer, if you know how to read it. Uh, then there's the comic artist, brilliant comic artist Chris Ware. Um, I think this is the uh, back cover, Jimmy Corrigan. Anyway, uh, what was amazing to me about Chris Ware is that he does these comic layouts that are not just a chronological sequence of panels, but this really elaborate, sprawling, like, uh, structure of, of intersecting uh, schematics and diagrams. Like there are genealogy charts and uh, maps and this is sort of multi-dimensional graphs all made up of these little narrative panels. And that helped me to understand that um, 
the world of sort of multi-panel compositions goes beyond just sequential comics. Again, probably not surprising. Um, Eco was a huge influence. I mean, in terms of wordless storytelling, and the game takes place in these mysterious but organic-feeling um, sand-colored ruins that that look a lot like you know something from a David Roberts painting. And uh, again, just the way that it's has this very sort of patient, quiet way of slowly creating awe that I was was hugely impressed by, and it was a huge influence. Uh, last, chronologically, is a comic called The Arrival by Sean Tan, uh, which is has some of the most inventive, imaginative visuals I've ever seen. Uh, the whole story is an allegory for the experience of immigrants and refugees arriving in an unfamiliar country and having to deal with all kinds of strange, bizarre creatures and objects. There's actually far more um, intricate and, and imaginative images in the book, but I chose this one because you know it's got a dragon uh, kind of swimming through city buildings, which obviously looks like the beginning of, of Gorogoa. Uh, so, and then I will now talk about the history of the game itself, as best I can remember it. I did initially want to make a comic. Uh, that was my plan, and I wanted to do it um, you know, graphic novel style, where all the multiple, multiple panels are laid out on a page. I made about 10 pages, and then I bogged down because I was having trouble with the story. It was too hard to go back and change the parts that I had already written, and um, I just had planned badly. But the other thing, the other reason I, that I sort of lost direction or drifted away from that project is that I was more interested in the composition of the pages and putting all these panels together in different ways than I was in sequential storytelling. I loved, you know, for all the reasons I've uh, I've uh, touched on so far, like these. Images in isolation fascinate me. Images in mysterious combination fascinate fascinate me. You know, and images in these little boxes and frames. Um, I found that really compelling. So, you know, I've asked myself, um, what is it about this? What is it about these little panels, these little framed images that I am so in love with, and and why? Like, what's what's led me down this road? So I've given a lot of thought um, to what is inherently compelling about a frame, just putting a frame around an image floating in space. And first of all, frames are something we're very, we deal with constantly in our lives. They go around the border of your TV or your phone, and you consume almost all games and media through one of these little frames. and. Normally, you're training yourself to forget that the frame is there. Just let the kind of burrow your mind into the image inside the frame. Let it expand and wrap around your face, uh, which is sort of the way VR works. No. Seems a little bit unstable, but we'll see how it goes. Um, and yeah, the, what, what immersion means to us is forgetting the frame is there, forgetting that this is uh, a work created by somebody, and just you're just supposed to let it become your world. But I, you know, I think working on making a comic uh, inherent or, or Engaging with comics makes you see the frame more clearly, I think. Because in order to read even a basic comic, you can't immerse yourself for very long within any one panel. You have to keep pulling your mind, your consciousness, back out of that panel and then pouring it into the next panel. Uh, and so you are, at least for that, for a moment, you're compelled to see the frames, the little boxes containing the panels. 
Uh, of course, in the case of a sequential storytelling, like with a comic, you can still get away with kind of losing yourself in one panel at a time. And that's part of the reason why I became interested in multi-panel compositions that were not necessarily sequential to try and keep the, the player's consciousness more in the multi-panel space and not allowing them as much to escape into individual scenes. You know, and I think that even putting one panel, one thing by, by itself in the middle of the screen is, has a power to it. I mean, I've clearly shrunk this down. For the fact that there's all this white space around the outside of the panel must be intentional when you see this. There has to be some message or logic uh, behind that choice. And, that, and again, that's what, the, for me, the, uh, the power of the frame is. Looking through a frame is like sitting at a window, looking at a window. Like whatever is outside the window, you can't reach. Um, you can see it, but you can't be part of it. Uh, you can only allow your mind, your consciousness to travel out through the window. And that's has sort of a, a human kind of sweet sadness to it, I think. Uh, and that same kind of sadness is present when you play games or or watch TV in a way that's that's poignant. It's not it's not uh, problematic, at least not entirely. Uh, and a frame can also be a clue. So if you if you look at this image and then I add a frame to it, it seems like I'm trying to tell you something. I'm drawing your attention to something for some unknown purpose. Uh, could be a clue. Could be foreshadowing. Shrinking the focus down concentrates attention, and it just and it concentrates meaning. And if you've ever seen someone put a an empty picture frame on a wall, uh, you may have found that irritating uh, because it's an abuse of power. There, it's like somebody tapping on the shoulder to get your attention, and then when you turn around, they're just checking their phone. It feels like a bad joke in a way. Uh, and a frame is also an act of curation in that it has chosen to show something and not everything else. It chooses one subject over another, and therefore it's, it's not neutral. It cares. And it's, it's including one thing and excluding almost everything else in the world. Uh, it can also represent uh, affection. I mean, if you see something inside a frame, it often means that it's precious to someone. Uh, the frame is a little bit like a halo uh, or a little box where you would put a sacred object. You know, you put a frame around something and it sort of becomes automatically a little bit like a religious icon. Uh, the frame is mysterious inherently, I think, because it limits our view, it limits what we can see um, intentionally, willfully. So if you see something in a frame, I think that increases, you know, you might look at any picture and wonder what's outside the frame, what's in the part you can't see. But by making the frame more visible, you make that uh, mystery, you bring that mystery to the, to the fore and make it more, and make it more powerful, I think. And lastly, a frame acts as a kind of prison. Everything that's inside the frame is trapped in there. It can't get out. So as soon as you create a frame and put something in a frame, you're creating a kind of tension. Because when you see a prison, you want to see an escape from that prison. Even if it's unconsciously, we want to see the frame be broken uh, and transcended. So these are all qualities that frames, I think, in my opinion, uh, have inherently, just by being there, just by, by showing up, without any special uh, effort on anyone's part. Now, since the eventual goal is to make a game out of this, like what happens when you add interactivity to a frame? And let's say that interactivity is only, is just limited, like as it is in Gora Goa, to changing your point of view, to moving from your to zooming in on something within the scene. 
Well, by zooming in, you are reframing the thing you zoom in on. And because the frame has all of the, uh, the power that I've been describing, you're, you're transferring all that power to whatever you zoom in on. You know, you're, you're adding poignancy to it, you're making it into a clue, um, you're making it into an expression of affection or a prison, all of those things. Uh, in Urgoa, framing things is your power. It's your only power as the player. So it's like, it's your, it's your superpower. And then things just get even more interesting when you put multiple images together. Uh, because, you know, just like in, uh, in the movies with, monta with you know, editing montages, when you put images next to each other, the mind tries to connect them and make a story out of whatever's there. And that possibility space is one of the reasons why I drifted away from sequential comics, because in a comic sequence, you, you know what the relationship is normally. There's a chronological relationship. It goes left to right or right to left and then top to bottom. If I just put four images without telling you how they're related, um, that's, that's a deeper mystery. It's kind of like uh, you, you frame four pictures and put them together. It's kind of like curating your own uh, you know, um, gallery show, like at an art gallery. At every moment in the game, you're just recurating this little uh, set of pictures, um, which is, which is uh, I know this is emotionally powerful, I think. Um, I think the human poignancy that goes along with looking at pictures, uh, framing pictures, putting them, up, putting them up on the wall is something that is universally relatable and which I tried to make part of the story of the game as well by turning those same impulses inward and you know, making them part of the uh, motivation of the, of the protagonist in the game. But given all the steps I've talked about so far, I still haven't answered like how this, you know, could actually be a game. Frames are great and all, but how does, what, what is the game mechanic? Now, one of the first things I considered was, early on was to try and make some sort of card game because comic panels are, are sort of card shaped. So if you allow the uh, player to move them around, well, maybe it's a card game and, uh, the Fool's Errand, as I mentioned, very influential game that had this very cool, spooky, mysterious, tarot-based card game that was a little bit irritating because it was confusing. And a lot of people have asked me to, I've mentioned this card game many times, a lot of people have asked me to see the prototype, um, but there isn't one. And if you're wondering how that card game worked, I don't know. I never made it, I never figured out the rules, and the reason for that is because I don't know how to design card games, and my motives for making it a card game were, uh, were the wrong motives. I just wanted the, what I really wanted is moving the player to explore spaces and discover things, and the card game was just a way to motivate that, which means that I would be making a bad card game. And in any case, since the premise of the game is that you can change scenes, you can move around in them and change what's in the frame, you would sort of be uh, cheating at that card game, whatever it is. So yeah, that game never existed, and I'm, I'm not sorry. Uh, my thought thinking also has uh, drifted more towards dominoes, um, which uh, if you're not familiar, it's a tile game where you connect two things together based on the number of uh, dots in each side of the tile. So you're basically connecting things edge to edge based on a matching pattern. It's a lot simpler than most card games. I mean, at least the simplest variant is simpler. And again, it gives me a way to, for panels to interact. And I mean, and this is another mock-up, but like I, th I think at times I was thinking of something where like you would explore the world within the game and you would find dots on the wall or something or make dots. Um, maybe you have a gun and you can shoot holes in a wall. And then you use that to play tiles next to each other. 
Um, now this is before I'm thinking in terms of connecting pictures. But that doesn't really, that doesn't work. <laughs> I don't like that idea either. It doesn't really make sense. I'm not sure where it's leading. And it did occur to me that there's also a connection in my mind between dominoes and a jigsaw puzzle. If you think about it, a jigsaw puzzle is, has a bunch of, you know, tiles that connect together um, according to rules. They have to, the edge has to match the edge of the adjacent piece. It's just that the rule is different. In the case of a jigsaw puzzle, the rule is that the picture has to be continuous and the sides have to, shapes have to match. And in dominoes, it's, it's dots. So now I've sort of drifted back towards a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and I think, like once, I've, once you've gotten that far, I mean, I will, I've, always, I've always liked jigsaw type puzzles in games where you, you, know, you find like a torn photograph and you have to reassemble it. Or this one is another puzzle from the Fool's Errand. You're just moving tiles around until they form a image. It's like a jigsaw puzzle with square pieces. I don't know why, but I've always loved that kind of puzzle way more than it deserves. It's like a cheap thing to put in a game in some ways, but I, I always love it. So with all, it's sort of like with all of that DNA lined up, I think at this point the actual game that Gorogoa turned out to be seems almost inevitable. It's just a very small square jigsaw puzzle where you can move, where the pieces are like interactive video screens that you can move around in. And, you know, I think it's still, it still is connected in my mind to the idea of a card game or to cards, uh, except that it's more of a card trick now instead of a card game. And the nice thing about a card trick is you don't have to understand any rules in order to appreciate it. The main thing for it is to, be, is to feel magical. And I haven't mentioned the stacking mechanic, which is the other part of Gorogoa, but in my mind, that's just the same thing in another dimension. You're still aligning pictures, you're just doing it uh, vertically instead of laterally. Now, so you can interact with each tile, but what are you doing in there? What kind, it still doesn't quite answer what kind of game it is, given that it's not a card game and it's not a version of dominoes. What is it? Um, well, I grew up playing adventure games and, you know, e.g. Riven. And I, and I love them and that's what I wanted to make. And I like puzzles. But I knew that classic adventure games come under a lot of criticism from modern designers for having puzzles that are obscure or have this sort of needless, um, you know, Rube Goldberg complexity where what you can interact with and what you can't is, is muddled. You end up sort of, you know, trying everything on your inventory with everything in the world until you stumble across a solution. Um, those old games tend to, uh, like, fetishize really counterintuitive and, and weird uses for objects. And modern puzzle game design uh, has kind of taken the turn of putting everything into a, its own world. It has a very, very clear visual language, has a very, very clearly constrained set of rules, uh, so that you always know what, what the nouns and verbs are that you're dealing with and how to solve puzzles, and you can just like cleanly reason about things. And um, these two games, Portal and The Witness, are games that I, I love and you know, have put a huge amount of time in. But I felt like when moving away from the classic adventure game formula of puzzles that are, of hit, or that are hidden or buried in the world, there's a lost fantasy. And this is what I have recently been taken to calling the esoteric fantasy. And that's based on um, this sort of category of belief systems that's sometimes called Western esotericism. And it's not one belief or way of thinking, but sort of the set of belief systems that are thematically connected. And the overall theme is, is a belief in that the world is sort of a place that's enchanted with ancient secrets and hidden patterns. Uh, and it's, it tends to be 
uh, in reaction against both scientific rationalism and uh, organized religion. It's, it's much more interested in secret symbols and patterns. It's much more personal than organized religion. And, you know, I, I aspire to be a scientific rationalist, and I'm no longer a member, a practicing member of any organized religion myself. But I just realized recently that I have sort of like sentimentally, uh, emotionally, I'm drawn to uh, the esoteric. And that, and things like tarot uh, fall in that category, and, you know, secret societies like um, the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, and certain branches of uh, Christianity, especially in the early days of the church. But you can understand why human beings might want to believe something like this. The world is scary and it's chaotic um, and it's full of bad news. And if you can just decode somehow, find these secret compartments of meaning hidden in the world around you, that's both exciting and, and comforting. And I think that adventure games uh, touch on that fantasy by the way they hide their secrets and their puzzles within the world. And I also think that, for me, crucial to this, to the esoteric fantasy, is this idea of duality of meaning. Um, and that's where truths are hidden, but they're not hidden underneath or behind things. They're they're not hidden underneath or behind ordinary things, they're hidden as ordinary things. So when you look at an object, it has two meanings. It has, it's, a, it's the intersection point between two different, two different dimensions of meaning. Uh, so looked at and interpreted one way, it seems it has one ordinary meaning. Looked at and interpreted in a different way, it has a, a more transcendental or, or cosmic meaning. And so much of the design of Goragoa is about that duality. It's about hiding secrets within the world. And that means, in practice, that nothing in the design of Goragoa is, none of the puzzle pieces are meant to look like puzzle pieces. They're meant to look like natural parts of this world, which is a, which is a strange world, and it's, an, it's a fictional world, but it's supposed to be internally consistent. So, you know, you have something that is part on the left, something that's part of a train map, but is also part of a ladder. That's a duality of meaning. You have a character sitting in a window, there's also a face on a coin. Edifice of a building, that's also sort of part of a kind of a pachinko machine. And, I mean, I don't want to, this is, talk is not focused on visual design, but I just wanted to uh, try and make it clear just how much time and effort, how important it was to me to to achieve this effect where the interacting, interactive pieces, the pieces that, of the puzzle that fit together are hidden seamlessly in the world. These are two scenes that if you zoom in in the right way and fit them together, they they connect like so. And what that means is that, you know, for, at, at first glance, they, sh they shouldn't look like they're necessarily related at all. But it means that both scenes have this s invisible seam in them. And at the seam, they have to, you know, the shapes, the colors, the lines all have to match up between the two pictures. And the effect that has is that the constraints, all the design constraints from one scene, you know, the color palette, the lighting textures all kind of reach out into the other scene like tentacles through a, a dimensional uh, rift. And that horribly entangles the design of every scene in the game, especially because lots of the more complex scenes have, you know, four different of the, four of the, you know, of these seams all reaching in from different places. You know, one might be a daylight, daylit exterior, another is um, an interior at night, and it all has to fit together. And the visual style that I chose for the game, which is very, uh, it's, not, it's not photorealistic, but it is very dense, uses a lot of textures, uses a lot of lighting, that made it much harder to kind of seamlessly connect things together. And you can imagine a version of Goragoa that has a simplified art style and makes it much easier to design 
puzzles and, f and assemble levels um, because there's there's a regular pattern to how to what shapes are used, what kind of architecture is used. It could still look nice, but it would be more regular, and there would be a clear visual language, like maybe that red horizontal roof always means that you can connect two things together. But I think that if the game, and then this, you know, this would also allow you to design far more puzzles than are in the game that I made, uh, and explore the sort of mechanical concept of the game much more fully than I did. But I think if you were actually playing this game, what happens over time is that your mind stops seeing buildings and and walls and starts just seeing a schematic. You just see the logic, the same tools that allow you as the designer to quickly assemble the world allows the player to mentally disassemble it. And if you're making something that is about puzzle solving, then that's fine because you want puzzles are actually solved in that abstract, you know, rational schematic space. But I, I mean, I don't want the player to be able to look at a scene in Goragoa and take it apart with their mind to see. I don't. I want the seams to be invisible. And I paid a really high price for that in terms of the length of time it took to make the game and the possible puzzles that I wasn't able to implement. But speaking of which, why have puzzles at all? I, I mean, a lot of people that loved Gorgo initially just liked to kind of explore. They weren't really interested in puzzles. And uh, puzzles tend to make people stop playing. They get blocked. They mean to come back to it. They don't. And given that I wanted to create a more of a tone or an experience, why not just have an exploration-based game with no puzzles? Well, I mean, first of all, I just like puzzles. I've grown up, grown up playing them, um, so that's a personal indulgence. But I also think that puzzles are connected to this um, esoteric fantasy that I've been talking about, this idea that there are secrets, a secret pattern hidden in the world all around us. Because after all, if it were easy to stumble across those hidden patterns in the real world, we would have found them already. So if we're going to hope that they're there, they have to be challenging to find. And discoveries about the world gain substance from the amount of effort you put into uncovering them. And we feel like we're being sort of forced or required, you know, to look carefully or think differently about the world. I think the difference also between a puzzle and a problem or just a challenge is that a puzzle feels designed. Uh, it, has a, it has a creator and is therefore a message to the person who solves it, which is not necessarily a good thing. If you're trying to create an immersive experience, then a, a created puzzle might break immersion. But if part of the fantasy, part of this esoteric fantasy, is about communication with something mysterious and unknown that created the world, then, then puzzles are perhaps preferable to problems. But uh, one problem I ran into once I decided to put puzzles in the game is I quickly was tempted to make things very mechanical, with, as in like actual machine parts, such as this shelf puzzle where you adjust the weights on the two sides of this shelf to tip it back and forth, which is now my least puzzle, least favorite puzzle in the entire game. Like if I had another six months, I might have I might have cut it. Um, but it's it's fine. In earlier drafts of the game, though, there were many more of these mechanical type puzzles with counterweights and pulleys and things going up and down. Uh, they got much more complicated. And there was an earlier version of this puzzle involving a train map that had the little train car on the map going around in through this whole kind of spaghetti maze of multiple interconnecting tiles with, um, with different uh, train maps on them. But I realized after a while that that was breaking, that was destroying the, the tone I was trying to create. If you're fiddling around with some, some mechanical system, that stops, feeling, uh, that stops feeling meaningful or important uh, after a certain point. I mean, it's just, it's just a machine. And usually you're fiddling with it for 
much longer than it has anything to actually say to you. So I had to kind of quash that instinct to make a bunch of fancy mechanical puzzles because that's not what this game was about and achieve this kind of balance between things that feel surprising and magical and can be figured out. They require some effort to figure out so the player is not just stumbling by accident into solutions the entire time, but which are also uh, much more varied and uh, less purely, you know, machine-like because, you know, there's a, there's a tension between something that is a machine and something that feels um, organic or, or spiritual. And now I want to talk about an interaction decision I made uh, that was kind of the last fateful decision in the design of the game. As I mentioned, uh, it, I was originally, I mean, this was this is based on adventure games, and originally each tile was going to have full adventure game type controls where you could enter a scene, click on objects, open doors, push buttons. For example, this door that you see here could have a combination lock on it. That's a simple puzzle. Um, you might have to search something nearby, a graveyard, get a number off a headstone. And that would make my life a lot easier uh, because, as I mentioned, these multi-tile connecting puzzles are a huge uh, pain in the butt to make. And even though they're, those are the big <laughs> money makers in terms of the game, it might be nice to be able to pad out the length a little bit or just you know have a few of these tile connecting puzzles or or quite a few of them, but also some you know, little single tile puzzles to, to ease the strain on myself as a designer. And that, you know, I'll never know whether that would have worked. Maybe that was a good idea. But in any case, I decided to make this rule, which is that the player can't touch anything, can't physically interact with anything in the game world because after all, I mean, I said earlier on that the power of the player is all about reframing. That's what the game is about. Every puzzle in the game should concentrate on that mechanic, that idea, and that idea alone. And if I gave myself that safety net, uh, that way out by making you know, one tile puzzles, then I would be sure to abuse it. So this was an attempt to put place discipline on myself as a designer. As I began to work on the game, however, I became clear that that was a hugely impactful decision. If you look at this little hoist puzzle, um, it would be simple if the player could just click on that uh, crank handle, hoist the bucket up. I don't know why, but that could be a puzzle. Very simple, until you take away the player's ability to physically touch anything. And the kind of solution I come up with instead is to like put a counterweight here. The player can't input energy into the world, so I basically have to build potential energy into the scene. And then when these two tiles are connected, the weight goes down, the bucket goes up, which is great, except that when you put these two tiles together, this change happens immediately. Just by virtue of the scenes being connected, the weight in the bucket move. Uh, that means that you can solve that puzzle by accident. You put it together, things, things start moving before you even know what you did, and then it's over. And accidentally solving these systems was a major problem with the design uh, throughout development. So it was it was very costly. If you just have the ability to turn one crank handle. Not only does it require one extra step to hoist this bucket up, you have to first connect the tiles, then turn the crank, but it also means you can, cr you can it's, it makes it reversible. You can crank the bucket up, you can crank it down, and that, what that does is it opens up a whole state space for possible puzzles, which I had, and I just closed the door on all of that. And believe me, I made versions of this, of this uh, hoist puzzle, and they get very complicated. Um, I was just looking at an old uh, build of the game that does this, has these two glass jars. The jar is a hole. You can put things inside the jar. That changes the weight. 
it's frankly too much like the shelf puzzle also. And it just kind of felt lifeless. And one of the very first puzzles in the game with the crow uh, has this problem. I mean, you can absolutely solve it by accident. And I had to expensively animate this whole crow just to knock a fruit off a branch because the player can't shake the branch to drop the fruit into the bowl. So the crow took a ton of time to animate and this puzzle basically solves itself once you get the tiles in position. Now that's okay because this is a basically a tutorial. This puzzle is teaching you about the mechanics of the game at the, in the very early stages. But this would become a huge headache later on, as I've said. Besides, you know, maybe there are some interesting multi-panel puzzles that I was leaving on the table. Like let's say you want the, the combo to the door on the left, and the information that you get from the graveyard is in another tile. Well, maybe that's, you know, that's sort of like tiles connecting in a different way. They're, they're connecting through the dimension of information. And, you know, when I put it that way, it, it sounds cool. So I experienced some regret that I lost the ability to do that because you can't easily enter a combination in a door. Um, as it happens, the game sort of does contain a combination lock in this clock tower, spoiler alert. You have to set the two hands of the clock to a particular time to get something to happen. So it's like the it's like a combination lock with two dials on it. And the method that you have to use to set those two dials is extremely complicated, um, involving compasses and heating up uh, pressure vessels. And it took so long for both me as a designer and it's so complicated for the player just for them just to enter this combination that when you play the game, I just give you the answer up front. The process of entering the combination is the whole puzzle. So that's the sort of backwards position that I found myself in um, because of this no hands design rule. Um, Another puzzle I always wanted to make, and wasn't able to because of this, um, is this fuse puzzle where you light a fuse in one tile, it burns all the way through other tiles, and eventually sets off a rocket or something. I thought that would be really cool. But then how do you light this fuse? I mean, I could, like if the player had the ability to interact with things, I could put a matchbox in there. But they can't. However, one good thing about constraints is that sometimes it does make you think outside the box. And I had this idea that, well, a lion's tail looks sort of like the burning end of a fuse. So maybe you zoom in on the lion's tail, it becomes a lit fuse, and you assemble this puzzle like this. But it's, that still felt like a stretch. Um, I, <laughs> I couldn't actually make that work. But at least I'm thinking in interesting ways precisely because I made, my, made life hard for myself. And one of my favorite puzzles in the game came about this way. You know, I was musing one day and I thought, man, the crenellations of a castle wall and the style and the uh, beams of a stylized sun, they kind of look, it kind of looks like a gear system, like a rack and pinion gear system. And if I could move the castle wall, I could kind of turn the sun like a gear. But how do I do that if the player can't interact with anything? My first idea was that there's a directional navigation button that you can click on, the button moves the camera, um, and because the camera's moving and it's a parallax scene, the castle wall moves in the foreground, but the sun stays where it is. And that difference in parallax motion causes the gear to turn, which is a, which is a cool idea, but I also felt like it was kind of cheating because it's sort of like a one panel puzzle. It's basically a machine with, an, with a button to activate it, except the button is just one of my navigation buttons. So I thought about it some more, and in the final game, the, what causes the camera to move, and thus the wall to move, and thus the sun to turn, is the character marching through the desert. And that meant the energy that's driving the whole system is coming from the character. And that, is, that was a really great thing just from a storytelling and narrative standpoint. Uh, especially because you know the, the themes of this chapter have to do with the character 
uh, sort of their, the character's act of devotions um, driving this sort of clockwork of these uh, uh, periodic rituals. So I was really happy with that, how that came out, uh, and it was all, again, a product of this constraint that I put on myself. And once I took the player's body away, because I can't interact with anything, that opened up a whole new range of possibilities that I don't think I would have, this kind of freedom that I don't think I would have otherwise considered. Because if, I don't impl if I'm not implying that the player has a body, then the, then the player's point of view can, can just fly across space. If you see something in the distance, you can just go there, no explanation required. And even more exciting are things like you can see a character's thoughts and then just enter them. I don't need to explain who you are or how you got the power to enter his character's thoughts because I have this sort of useful ambiguity about the player's relationship to the world since they're not physical. I can go, you know, fancy stuff like inside China patterns. And again, uh, the this comes out thematically because if the player isn't physically able to touch things in the world, that creates a question of whether the player is physically there uh, or what the player's relationship is to these scenes. And that creates the possibility that it is, it is a mental process, that this, is, you can, this can be seen as a character going through their memories and rearranging them in retrospect and looking for missed connections. Uh, and of course, when you're replaying a memory, you can move around in it, but you can't alter it. So the, your inability to touch things has this evocative power. And you know, looking through these like mental windows into these uh, in these memories becomes like uh, has the same poignancy that I was describing earlier of looking through the frame of a panel. So, final question was, what kind of story can I should I be telling with all these? mechanics that I've come up with. And, over, and I had to just, I didn't start with a story and then build everything else. I, it was more like I, I found a pattern, the interaction of panels. I found a, a lot of mechanical things and, and formal things that, I, that were really compelling. And then I had to figure out sort of why they were compelling and then build, sort of adapt the story over time to that, to what was, what was powerful about this medium that I created. See, normally, when you have a narrative puzzle game, the protagonist solves puzzles, and that's how that's you know that fits with the standard model of storytelling, and that the character overcomes obstacles, um, and that makes sense, and that's how it usually works, and it works well. But in Goragoa, the player is solving puzzles outside of the world, in a sense, outside of the story. The protagonist isn't really solving them, it's the player. And, and again, that puts the player into a kind of distant, oblique, and I think um, poignant, sort of like remote position with respect to the story. And it's also told, the story folds time and space in, in weird ways. You might you know, even have characters in at different ages occupy the same space the same character, uh, and that's just a confusing way to tell a story. And I, you know, I could take a novel, I could rip out all the pages and scatter them all over the city, and it might be a fun puzzle for you to go collect them all, but that's, that's at the expense of trying to tell a story well. So I needed a kind of story that was well suited to this oblique storytelling approach. And that's why uh, it's structured as a parable, because a parable isn't just a isn't just there for dramatic satisfaction. It's an act of communication, and as as I was saying, the core fantasy, the sort of esoteric fantasy, is that there's something, whether it's the cosmos or the gods or the ancients, that are trying to, on some level, to communicate with you. There's someone or something out there, and so a story that is inherently communicative and not necessarily literal. Uh, is a good fit for 
my approach to this medium. And parable is also tends to be a puzzle. It's an allegory. It has symbols that need to be decoded. And that means that every parable has kind of two messages. It's whatever the message is that you uncover by decoding it, and also the more general lesson about duality of meaning, that you need to look more closely at what you see or what you're told to, uh, to uncover the truth. So what is the parable about? Well, I mean, I, this, it gets maybe too circular at a certain point, but the parable what is about the themes that interested me, that made me interested in the form, which are about this lifelong quest for this hidden transcendent meaning, um, this secret structure in the world. And it's about what, that, what devotion to that quest means for a person uh, and how the relationship to that quest changes us. Um, but I, don't, I never like to say too much uh, specific about the story, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'll leave it up to your interpretation. This is me, email, Twitter, and that's it. All done. I don't know if we have time for questions. I do. Okay. The room does. If you have any questions, I'll give you the If you Um, hello, Jason. Hello. Uh, thanks for your talk. I'm a big fan of Gurgaon. And my question is, during the early stages of your development, how, do you, how did you convince yourself to invest this much time and maybe your finance into creating this game without knowing how this game will fare? Well, I, I didn't know how long it was going to take. So, and I, that's, that's, yeah, that's an important part of this story and why I don't think anybody should necessarily do the same thing is that, yeah, I, I thought it was going to be done. I had made up a sign at one point saying late 2013, early 2014. Uh, I never had to believe that it was worth investing five years in. I just had to believe that it was worth investing like another eight months in. And it just that eight months just kept getting extended. Um, so, so I don't know. I'm, I mean, if I, when I look back, I don't regret it. But, and I knew I really felt like I was onto something. But if I had known the beginning, how long was it actually going to take? I don't know if I would have gone through with it. Just hold it. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hi, Jason. Hello. Hi. Um, I do have a question. It's about the, uh, do you have any suggestion for the artists and the programmer? How can they communicate well? Because they do have different thinking in a brain. Yeah. Right. Obviously, it's not my, not something I have personal experience with because um, I did both. And, I, and I've also, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> No, and I've often wondered about how people do communicate because um, because I was doing the art myself, I was able to iterate a lot and like try a bunch of different things. And also, if there's anything that I couldn't do as an artist, like something I couldn't draw, I could just change the design so that I didn't have to draw that. Uh, which is, if I were an artist for hire, I would just be fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yeah, I... I mean, I, I don't know what the, what the secrets are. I think it's like you have to have a, a good, a very, very good uh, personal relationship um, such that you can make a lot of, you can make a lot of quibbles that and the artist, you know, isn't, isn't offended. Uh, and that, you know, ideally the artist can push back on the design to some extent because there are some things, some great ideas that you can only get to by allowing the art to kind of drive drive the bus as far as as far as the game goes for a while and then maybe hand the controls back to the designer but i, I don't know if there are any professional relationships that that work that way i mean i'm sure there are but it's, it's rare i think 
那请问还有谁有什么问题？啊、哦，好。Hello， 呃、uh, ，Hello， 呃、uh, ，Hello， 嗯、um, ，I would, I would, excuse me， 呃、uh, ，I would like to ask， 呃、uh, ，How do you， 呃、uh, ，work in the isolation for this， this long time？ I mean， it's like I， I took a leave for around half a year， and， and it end up getting feel like people， 呃、uh, ，without social interaction， it, it kind of feels like。People, you know, kind of forgetting you. And well, you don't have to give up all social interaction, but but it is hard to work alone.、Um, it can be hard to be productive. A couple of things. I mean, for many, for the last couple of years of the game, I worked. I went to a co-working space where a bunch of game developers all worked in one big room. That was that helped a lot psychologically, although it could be a little bit distracting. For social reasons, like because people were always talking, and it was just tempting to get involved in in a, in a conversation.、Um, I also found that going to—I mean, this is hard because it's expensive—but going to shows、um, to show off your game,、uh, to conferences and, and everything, it's not always clear whether that pays for itself financially in terms of getting it out, getting the word out there to the press or to the public. But for me, at least as someone working alone, that those moments where I see act. People actually play the game, and like ordinary people,、um, not just other game developers, were really, really important for keeping my morale up. And you know, I would have like a burst of energy after each one of those experiences that would last for several months. So that's something to consider when you're weighing whether to take your game out there and, and show it, which, as I say, can be expensive. Wait, wait. That's what I have. Uh, hello. Uh, I want to ask uh, which comes the first? Because、uh, you said you、uh, first you going to make a comic about the game. So、uh, which comes the first, the story or the puzzle or the art artworks? The the mechanic mostly came first,、um, and when I first designed the game back in. The first version of Gorgoa they put out in 2012, which is which you can play、um, in most versions of the game that are out now.、Uh, you can unlock it after you beat the game.、Um, I had the story I had in mind for that game was much much simpler than the one I ended up making for the finished game because I just hadn't given it given it as much thought, and I was willing to let things be sort of. Dreamlike and not really, not fully justified. So, I did the early version of the game, and the comic had a completely different story. No relation, to, no relationship between that story and the game. It was just just the mechanics that interested me. But even after I released the first version of the game into the world, you know, you don't. I think you want to get to a place where the story and the mechanics and the themes are all working together. But. I think in reality, when you're making things, you often start with one little corner of that,、so、just one thing that interests you, like one image or or a mechanic or a scene, and then you play with that and kind of build outward from there until you see the higher level structure, the sort of like th thematic structure that ties everything together, and then you go back and bring everything in into line. So, I、uh, yeah, it's close to the truth to say that I started with the mechanics and the and then found the story through the mechanics. Thank you very much.、Uh, hello, Jason. Thank you for coming. And、uh, my question is, I have two questions.、Uh, one is, what's the meaning of、uh, what's the meaning of Goro Goa? What, the word Goro、uh, Goro Goa. How do you come <laughs> up with that name? What's what's the meaning behind it?、Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. One more.、Uh, and my other question is,、um, what, what's、uh, what's your thought process behind、uh, coming out with the puzzles? Well, the name—it doesn't. It's not a word in any language.、Um, it, it's it's the name of the creature in the game, and it's、uh, the idea is that it's an, it's a really ancient word,、um, you know, sort of even from before language, and meant to sort of sound like something like the sound of thunder or an earthquake, something like that. Because I, you know, I didn't want to use language in the game, so when it came time. 
I didn't want to use any earthly language in the game. So when it came time to make the title for the game, that was a problem. And I had the idea of just naming it <laughs> a non-existent word, although it's, it's a word I've used in other projects. In fact, it's used in that comic that you just saw one frame of as the name of a prison. <laughs> but uh, it is, it's something I've just, it's always had a, uh, it's been a meaningful sound. So I, I don't know if that was a good idea or not. Um, remind me of the second part of the question. Uh, how do you come up with the, the puzzles? What was the pro uh, thought process? Well, normally, I, I, you know, this, the hardest thing about building any puzzle is forming a, a visual connection between two scenes. So, I mean, I think the abstractly, my approach to puzzles is to come up with, play around with a system in my mind and, and then find something surprising or unexpected that you can do with that system, and then the puzzle is leading the player to make that discovery. Uh, but usually, you know, I would, I would come up with some, some interesting way for images to connect, and then I would lead the player to that discovery of connecting, of the images connecting. But I also, as time went on, I tried to make the puzzle so that just connecting two tiles together doesn't solve the whole puzzle. And that was to get around the um, sort of accidental solving problem that I was describing earlier. I think that's okay up to a point because the game is partly about surprising discoveries. But later on, I would take, I would have this sort of like surprising discovery phase of a puzzle where the player, the player finds these connections, and then they would have to assemble those connections into uh, into a kind of order of operations puzzle where uh, they have to understand what the parts are and then put them together in the right order. Thank you.